Good morning, pottery peeps. Uh, welcome to Hollow Creek Pottery. I am Tiffany, and today I am sharing you my bestseller. I cannot keep these in when I make them. I make a big batch, and I only do it twice a year. I do it around Christmas. Well, usually start in October. This year, I got um, I started a little earlier because I knew what would happen, and um, I've got a couple more that I got to make before I go in on Wednesday. And I make them also in May uh, around Memorial Day, so they're available for um, Father's Day. So this is it, chip and dip bowl, okay? Um, I make them traditionally too, where you do the big platter and you have the bowl in the middle, but these ones I cannot keep in, all right? Um, mainly because they work so great for men, because you can sit on the couch with your salsa and your chips with one thing and not make a mess, all right? So women love to buy them for their men and the men love to eat out of them. And actually women love to eat out of them too. They also work great for serving. You can put them on the counter or, you know, on the table or whatever, have your dip, chips. You could even do soup and sandwiches in these. So very, very versatile and um, a really unique item that um, is a one-off. Talk about a gift. You give them chips and salsa and one of these. Done. You know, that could be a great family gift too, okay? Um, a little bit of history on this. I've been making these for, oh God, 15, 20 years. My son, I've got four kids, and none of my kids really asked for pottery, <laughs> which is so hurtful, right? You know, this is what you do. You want your kids to love it too. Anyway, my son, when he was about 15 or 16, asked for Christmas to have his own chip and dip bowl. And so I made it. I was just thrilled absolutely thrilled that one of my kids appreciated what I did and so I made him one and then of course on Christmas morning all the other kids were so upset they didn't have their own so next year I rectified that so in my family um we've got six of us and, and you know they all have their chip and dip bowls um so makes it makes it nice it's a great great gift so here's one in this color I do them all different none's the same and um, I'm going to show you how I make these today. So let's get you set up at the wheel and hopefully we can beat the light coming in my windows. Let me just show you what's happening. It is, it is 8.30 here. <laughs> I got out early. I love my windows. I really do. I love the light it brings in. But I have found this time of year with um, the sun at a different angle. It is streaming through these windows. Makes it a little hard to film. I might be a night filmer. Okay, let's get you set up. Okay, we're gonna have to hurry and throw throw these because I'm I'm afraid my light's gonna cut out your ability to see with the sun coming up. So what I start with, um, you need you can only make you have to make two. You can't just make one because this is the small bowl that gets cut in half. Okay, so you got to throw two big bowls, one small bowl, right? Um, or as many as you want. But that's usually how I start. Um, with the chip and dip bowls. You know, if I'm doing eight chip and dip bowls, I'm doing four small bowls. Um, this is three and a half pounds of bee mix by um, Aardvark, and then one pound of sand clay. So I usually throw the big ones first, and then um, throw the small ones, because small ones are gonna dry out faster than the big ones. I am throwing on a hydro bat. It, um, Huh, game changer, let me tell you. Um, better than the plaster bats. I don't have to deal with plaster. And um, they, I got them at the ceramic shop. They are a bit pricey. I have six of them in the studio and I wish I had more. Because if you're doing plates or platters or um, donuts or things like this that you don't want to wire off, they literally will dry um, and pop off So when they're ready. So Also, I'm not so good at throwing on my wheel just yet because I can't kick. So we'll see. Might just end up having to speed this up if it becomes, my kick wheel has one speed, fast <laughs> and slow. <laughs> Unless I can kick and speed it up. So basically I'm just gonna center this, get my hands wet, and get my um, elbows braced into my hips. And use that speed, I'm gonna cone up, cone down. And then throw this bolt. I'm using this part of my hand. I'm gonna hold 
key is to make yourself centered. You're not centered. You're not going to center any clay. A very yoga-ish experience to center clay. I'm going to do it one more time. I just want to make sure I'm really good and centered. I actually prepared this clay a couple of days ago. Wanted to film this for you and the lighting's never been right, so I actually had it sitting waiting. Okay. I'm gonna open. I always open with my thumbs and my fingers on the side. These are not trimmed. I actually am one of those potters who learned how to wet trim. So, and since I make so much stuff, Trimming is a huge time suck. <laughs> so learn how to throw with minimal trimming. It'll save you so much time. I'm gonna compress the bottom back since I just yanked all that clay out. So I'll compress from the side to the middle a couple of times. Make sure that that's flat. And then I always give it a little, fun little swirl in the bottom. Because it's fun, you know, we need fun. Plus it gives the glaze another fun place to break. Now when it comes to water, you don't want water sitting on your bottom. But if you throw really fast, you don't have to worry about the water. But beginners or people who don't throw very fast, definitely be mindful of the water. Okay, so I'm just going to make myself a cylinder and i got an air bubble. Dang it. Pop that air bubble. Get that out of there. An air bubble will um, take your stuff off center faster than anything. Okay, so I'm gonna dig in with my finger down here at the bottom. Most of your clay squats right down there at the bottom. I'm going to pull this up. When I get to the top, sometimes I'll just put my finger there or I'll compress there. I'm going to probably do one more pull and then we'll finish the shape on this thing. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to add the foot. When the bowl's like this, I have plenty of room to get down here. These hydro bats, though, the clay does stick to them, and it is hard to get off. But when you're working on these hydro bats, you definitely want to cut that film because they'll pop off a lot easier. Let me get all those goobers off. Take that one out. I'm just bring my wing rib and still got a bump there. I need to get I don't want that there. So what I do is I take that wooden rib and I put it underneath there, lift that up just a little bit. Also allows the air to get to it. And then I come in here with the other end and I just press in there. Gives me a little bit of a shelf, and then I can take my sponge, round that off, and it gives me a really nice foot without a minimal effort. There are foot makers out there, um, and they're great, I've used them, but um, I have minimal tools at the wheel when I throw, and so it's just I've gotten into the habit of just using the tools that I have rather than searching for all the little fun ones. So now I'm going to go ahead and do another pull. And now I'm going to stretch this bowl out. When I do bowls, you want to get that clay up before you start pulling it out. 
Okay. And I'm just gonna mop at the water. I tend to leave my throwing lines. You can smooth them out. This is just personal preference. I actually like seeing the hand of the potter. In the throwing lines. And it also gives um, some visual interest for the glaze to highlight and that air bubble show back up. So let's get rid of him. And just smooth that one more time. And if you'll notice that the the rim here, I've given it a nice thicker rim. I like a beefier rim on bowls. They get a lot of wear and tear. If they're going to chip, that's where they're going to chip. And so if you leave yourself a little bit of clay up at the top, then you will, your customers will be a lot happier. So there's one. So go ahead and do another. And I'll speed you up for this one. So now we're just doing the little bowl. That will get cut in half for both of these. <clears throat> Make sure that um, your clay, I'm gonna get my wheel going faster. It needs to be tightened up, but I can't get down there to tighten it up right now. So I gotta stomp on it. Make sure that you, um, especially on these hydro baths, make sure that you get that really anchored on the bottom. And the bowl is the same shape, so it makes it nice um, when you're throwing the same shape over and over and over again, your hands know the shape. And uh, so even though I've went from three and a half pounds to a pound, it's gonna know the shape. Pottery's just cool. The whole process of it is just cool. But this is my favorite, it's throwing. I love to be on the wheel. So having these knees out of commission sucks. This is my favorite thing, best medicine ever, is to be out here. I do not put the swirl, of course, because I'm gonna be cutting this in half. And then I'm just going to pull that up. You do want to, um, Keep your walls consistent, even, I want my walls on this to be as consistent as the walls that I threw there. It's tempting to go thinner on these bowls, but try not to. Because if they're too thin, you're going to have problems when I show you how we join them. Okay, so that's it. I don't bother to add a foot, but I will clean off the slurry that just glues down to the wheel on or the hydro bat. So now, now we gotta sit and wait for them to dry out. So as soon as they're dry enough, this guy, the small bowl, is gonna dry a heck of a lot faster than the big bowls, okay? So you do need to be aware of that. So sometimes you might have to cover these guys up. That's why I always throw them last. But um, I just might, it's, for the end of November, it looks like we're gonna have another 50 degree day. And um, I might put them outside in the sun and let the sun dry them out. Anyway, so I will pick you back up when we're ready to join these and I'll show you how I do that, okay? 
Okay, we're back. Um, these are ready to be joined. I did have to wrap the smaller bowl for a little while, about an hour ago I wrapped it. Um, it's got a little wiggle, um, not much. I like this bowl to be more leather hard um, because I'm gonna be pressing against this bowl. So I need it a little bit more rigid than this one. This one is definitely softer. It's still a little, little sticky, not bad, but a little sticky. So this one might not pop off. Um, let's see, time-wise it's noon now. So I threw these at around 8.30, 8.45. Um, so about four hours in the wintertime in, in um, Utah. So let me lower you down so you see what I'm working with here. And uh, we will get to joining these. So, sorry I'm bumping you, bumping you here. Okay, so what I do first is I literally cut this in half. And you just go for it. So, there you go. So sometimes when I cut them in half, it, I can just pull it right off of this... Um, Hydrobat, which I love, absolutely love. So then I will take this guy and I flatten it, flatten out those corners. See how I did that? Because I'm going to be joining those. I need those corners to be um, flattened down. Otherwise, they're going to give me issues. And then I kind of, you know, rather than cut it at 45, I want that clay there because I'm going to need it. And so I will kind of press this with my finger so that I have more of a 45 there that I'm going to be joining, okay? And while I've got it, I'm going to clean up that bottom. Make sure, again, no sharp edges. When you teach pottery, you tend to repeat yourself all the time as one of my youngest students, um, Caroline, reminded me, it's like, you've already told me that. And it's like, yeah, and I will tell you that again and again and again. <laughs> it's just the way it is. So, got to drum this stuff in sometimes. All right, so then I'm going to bring my big bow, and I'm going to form it to this one. So, that's what I'm after. I want this. I don't want it up high. I don't want it up low. I want it to be even with everything. So then I will draw my line where I'm going to be joining. And then scratch it up. And really scratch it up. If you're going to have problems, this is where you're going to have problems. Scratch this guy. up to. All right, grab some clay, because <clears throat> you're gonna need some coils here. And this clay is actually leftover clay from the Santa's that I um, filmed yesterday for you. So it's a little harder than I want, but we'll soften it up. So when you got harder clay, um, Wipe down your table when you're going to roll a coil. So, I'm also, my hands are wet, so hopefully I will soften this up a little bit. My table's actually a little too wet. And, you know, the coil, it doesn't have to be a perfect coil. I mean, you're going to be smoothing this in. So, I just want a, coil, a long coil for joining the bowl. And then I do two small coils, coils for the sides. So, get this out here. That looks about right. So I'm going to have, you know, and then I'm going to go while I'm still rolling, I will do some thinner ones. So I have them ready to go. Because um, when you're doing these, that bowl wants to fall down. Sometimes you might have to prop it up with some clay. I 
actually, let's go ahead and leave this in case I do need to prop it up with some clay. So grab some slip and be liberal with it. And I will slip both of these. My slip is really thick, so I'm actually going to just kind of water this down just a little bit for this one. I got a bunch of slip on this one. All right, I'm actually, let's see if I can move you to where you're kind of over my shoulder. Let's see if that'll work. I need to get something to where I can move this easy enough. I'm working on a tablet and so Kind of jerky on this tripod. I need something that's a little smoother, but for now, we will work with what we got. So I'm going to come in here and press that corner. You want to support the outside too. And then a little wooden knife, and I'll just start smoothing that in. That's why you want that extra clay. You don't want to misshape in your, your bowl either, so you got to be kind of careful on there. Kind of tacking it at this point. I just want it to stay there. So the first time you do this, <laughs> It's like she made it look so easy. Well, I've done thousands of these. I used to actually sell wholesale up in Park City until I found out what he was getting for him. And it's like, forget that. He was getting, this was back 10 years ago and he was getting $65 for these. It's like, granted Park City, it's a completely different clientele, just an hour away. All right, so we usually just dip this in water and I'm gonna set that right over the joint. And what you wanna do is you want to support the bottom of this bowl and I would be better to have softer clay actually to do this with. I'll probably spend more time than I want smoothing this because can't press very hard otherwise you're gonna go right through and you don't want to misshapen the outside of this bowl. Because it's if it was more leather hard, I could be rougher, but then I have problems cracking. So just take your time. Smooth that in. And then do the exact same thing over here on the sides. And then I usually tend to bring this up, break it off. And this little wooden um, tool comes in any potter's toolkit. This is just the cheap little knife, but having that smooth little finger edge, extremely helpful for these. So I'm just, Taking my time and then I will reinforce this joint at the top, like that. And after this dries a bit too, I'll come back in with my sponge. I just nicked that with my fingernail. Start nicking things with the fingernail, it's time for the nails to go. I hate it when my nails get in the way. All right. I don't know how anybody does pottery with nails. Don't get it, because they always cause me more problems. I've seen some potters throwing with nails. <laughs> and it's like, how in the heck do they do that? It'd be nice to have nice nails, but no. Which is one of the sacrifices that I'm willing to give up to be a potter because being a potter 
is the best thing in the world. Being able to work with the clay, form stuff like this, make functional stuff out of stuff that's dug out of the ground. I mean, how magical is that? Okay, so just roughly do that. I should probably have clean water, but this will probably get a dark glaze, so I'm not worried about contaminating, having a little darker water. Now your fingers, I've said this before, say it again, fingers are your best tools. There's so many nerve endings in your fingers and you can feel so much with the clay. Don't rely on your tools, rely on your fingers. And don't think you gotta go out and buy a bunch of tools to get started. You don't. Modify things, modify credit cards for ribs. Um, but your fingers are always, always going to be your best tool. All right, so got that pretty much where I want it. Smooth the top so it looks like this one's kind of fallen a little bit. So we'll push that up. So these little guys that I did, I get them wet. Another one of my little favorite tools. And I will bring it in here. I'll pick this up so you can see it. Break that off. So let's see if I can actually. So I've laid that coil where the bowl meets the edge. And then I will do the same thing. Come in here and I'm just gonna smooth that in. This is kind of tricky. But I also, I like glazes to run on these. I like them to be kind of a statement pieces. A lot of times it's where I, I um, experiment. Because where's the glaze gonna go, right? I got a big bowl here. And so I will, when I glaze them, I will do heavy glaze on this joint. So sometimes you can't really get in there to smooth as much as you'd like because it's such a tight, tight area. So smooth the best that you can. Just make sure there's no cracking. Bring your favorite smoothing brush and smooth all of the tool marks that you just put in there out. Get some of that extra slip off because extra slip, that's what's going to crack. See what I mean about me always repeating myself? The ferrule, I think it's called a ferrule of your brush, is also a really good smoothing tool. So bring that in to just kind of define that bowl. So basically what I'm wanting is I want the bowls to flow together like they were one piece. I don't want it to look like a composite piece, you know, to where you joined pieces together. I want it to flow. I don't want any jerky edges. I want everything to be smooth and look like it's always been one piece. Okay, <clears throat> now the other side. Well, got some smoothing to do in here. And there is, I mean, sometimes when it's uh, more leather hard and you can handle it, it is easier to clean up at that point. You can see this is such a tight area cannot get my fingers in there. So I have to use the tool to press that coil, support on the outside, and then press that little, little tiny coil in there. You want to smooth against both bowls so that, like I said, they look like they were one piece it was always made this way. Take that little bit off. And then 
and smooth that little bit in. Time for the brush to finish her off. And then I will let this sit out until it pops off because it is still on the bat. The bigger bowl is still on there. Clean it up again after I pop it off. Just go over it one more time. And then it gets set on the shelf under plastic for probably a couple of days. This time of year, a couple of days, maybe a day. And um, the um, summertime, more than a couple of days, sometimes a week. So, and there you go. You have a chip and dip And this is what it's like when it's finished. Oh. <laughs> beautiful, right? Yes, beautiful. All right, I'm going to do the other one. And um, then these guys are done, and I can check this off my list and go to, well, my hands are wet, so I can't pull that up, so I will pull you up. <laughs> so I hope you like this one. Like, subscribe. Um, leave your comments. I'll get to them. Sometimes I don't get to them right away, but I will definitely get to them. And thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next one.